Good evening, everybody. This is Sean Jones, director of Corpus Christi. This is Patrick Stork, writer and co-star of Corpus Christi. And uh, Bridget Jones, nay Lawrence, I play Fight Girl. In? In Corpus Christi. All right. So here we are, our opening scene. Um, this scene's kind of cool because we shot it after everything else in the movie, about three you years past the actual hands. production. Um, yeah, sure. We found that um, it would be a little bit easier for us to kind of shrink everything down plot-wise into this nice little opening scene and uh, give everybody details of what was going on without having to spell it out in 20-minute uh, spurts. Yeah, we'd had a couple different openings to the film. Uh, there was one really long introduction uh, that took place before the movie. This is actually more of a bookend, but... Originally, we had um, a scene introducing my character and Stoney's character, uh, Mark and Steve, where we just set up all the plot points for the rest of the movie in one long, about six to eight minute tracking shot. And um, as interesting as tracking shots can be, eight to six minutes of yeah exposition doesn't always get the movie off on the right foot. Wasn't a lot of laughs. Not so much. Not a lot of laughs. A lot of rice. A lot of rice. All over uh, Matt's apartment building. Uh, Matt Herman, one of our investors, dash producer, was nice enough to lend us a. Uh, Full apartment building, although we only use the top right. floor and roof. Uh, and the floor below it. This and the floor below it for Dark. the gangsters later in the movie. Yeah. That is right. Um, here is a picture of Mike Stork, Pat's brother, and that is an actual picture he took while being pulled over by a police officer. Yep, yeah, that's about 200 yards from the house we grew up in, too. Um, yeah, good timing that, but luckily he's smart enough to take a picture of himself every time he's arrested. Smart. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, Aaron and Brad, which you may recognize from other Forbidden Pictures films. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, they play the cops in the Chainsaw Sally franchise. Mm -hmm. They also appeared in Good Sisters. That is true. Here they're detectives of sorts, um, sort of uh, a wire version of their characters in Chainsaw Sally. Um, in the background, keeping in with our uh, Baltimore theme, um, in the long shots is a bottle of suburban soda. Mm -hmm. um, the we've almond been smash been variety. Been of course, yeah. uh, now that we're talking right. about it, we haven't gone to said wide shot, but um, that's right. the fun of commentary. Yeah. Also, you'll notice the uh, Maryland state flag in the background uh, here, uh, not just to say that we're from Maryland, but also because those were on set. This actually was filmed, being that this is a police interrogation, uh, this is filmed okay. at an actual police building. Uh, Baltimore yep. City Police Department. Uh, it's the FOP Lodge. Uh, I was actually a bartender there for several years, and when we needed to get these scenes, we actually got permission to shoot in a real government building. Um, so, thank you, BCP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and you'll see more of that building in the uh, other half of the bookend and, and during the end credits. And uh, here we are at uh, Charlesville. Uh, this, uh, this, this is the Char Rib. This is our Winchester. Yeah, this is uh, home away from home. We've been going there for a long time. Um, Since we were 21 the first six times. Mm -hmm. um, we may or may not have fudged our age uh, when we first went there, but uh, that was actually at a different location. The bar relocated. This is currently up in Lutherville, uh, Maryland. And yeah, they, gave, they were very generous. They gave us the use of the place for a weeknight, uh, let us bring in all sorts of extras, all sorts of equipment, lighting, all that, you know. I mean, with the, with the caveat mm -hmm. that the bartender get to play the bartender. Mm -hmm. And um, also, you'll see her in a few minutes, but no, another bartender uh, plays a patron. Beer. So that was that was the no. small price to pay. No. And you'll notice the smoke wafting into the frames. Uh, this is, yeah, it's a long production history for this film, but this was filmed before smoking was banned in bars in Maryland. Uh, which made it much easier to shoot for those of us that smoke. Much easier to keep the cast in one place. Yeah. Right. And no CGI smoke in this movie. Yeah. Um, in the background, you'll notice when we go to Stoney's wide shot in red there is Zeb Drinkwater, who also plays Byron in the movie. Um, we thought it would be kind of funny since he uh, completely changed his look since the uh, main shoot. To just stick him in the background there, talking to uh, his friends. And uh, actually, if you look very, very closely behind the bartender, there's uh, myself, Kevin Perkins, and our 
DP Paul sitting at the very, the very fire. far end of the so nothing ever Of course, we won't there. show that shot again now uh, in keeping with the tradition <coughs> of our commentary. I just saw it There's uh, Jess, the what? other bartender from, from the charred rib that no. we were speaking of. Mm -hmm. the, and there she goes. My right. uncle has a storage locker. Yeah, this was basically a huge exposition died. scene. We wanted to get in and basically will. set up a whole bunch of the gimmicks that were going to come along. So I uh, wanted to make sure to set up the furniture angle, wanted to make sure to set up the brother's uh, leech angle. Uh, the love of beer angle. Love of beer angle. But these two were not really smart guys. Uh, we didn't want to make anyone think that these were gonna these were guys that were gonna figure everything out by the end of the movie um, maybe they'd have an awakening but you didn't want to count on it uh, also wanted to set up a gag early on that basically they had the solution to how to solve the entire movie within this conversation and quickly forgot it um, so that's in there as like a repeat viewing gag so the blackout drunk that leads them into this adventure in the first place also would have led them out of the adventure as well. Mm -hmm. And here we are. This is actually your house, Pat. Yeah. And then, uh, this is the, well, that's not the house I grew up in. No, those are your fries. <laughs> those those are were fries. your fries. So I've got to pay more. Yeah, but uh, we filmed this in the house I grew up in. Um, yeah, moved out there when I was eight. Uh, moved out of there when I was 18. And my parents still lived there when we were doing this. Um, still, uh, as always, let us do crazy business in their yard without paying too much attention. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stork. Yeah, we're surprised that there were cameras this time. Um, the last time we filmed something stupid at the house was when Mike and I blew up our own mailbox, uh, which is not on the special features menu because I haven't found the tape. Uh, this this van we're looking at right here is one of two cars that have died since the filming that are in the That's movie true. that have died since the filming of the of this movie. At least, yeah. That was the Pope Mobile, originally Kevin's van, then handed down to me, and then handed down to uh, the Scrappy. I can't believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, bring in our van. Uh, Stony still vomiting. Uh, Everly Method actor. We uh, have more vomiting in this film than uh, just about any other, so stand by me. And it's all stuff. He really, uh, he really brought it yeah. into this role. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. And that is a beta tape. Mm -hmm. And fourth wall gag. Uh, first of... Oh, there it is. Fourth wall. I don't think I ever got that tape out of that tree. Uh, this would be the first appearance of the title character, Christy. Thankfully, uh... And the first appearance of Poe Beer, which that's is one true. of Raven our beer. sponsors. Raven Beer. Raven, sorry, Raven, Raven Beer. Raven Beer. Raven Beer. Christy played by Gabby Demchek. Demchek, yeah. And Raven Beer, uh, provided by her father. Uh, this is, uh, my mother and my father. Um, very cool of them to do this. They're yeah. Very funny in the, in the movie. Very sporting to jump in. We gave them the lines, uh, pretty much on the spot. They sat at the dining room table and... Still not whenever. sure that your mom knew what... She she was talking about. Uh, I'm she sure does a great she did. job. Oh, they both knew what they were talking about. Not that they were necessarily both partakers. Um, this is. Um, and for as silly as the scene as it is, it's important just to know that my father was a part of something I did. Um, you know, starting out in filmmaking, but uh, yeah, that was a special thing. And he's 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 great in it, so yeah. that's even better. That he, uh, I don't think we could have gotten a, a better couple to play those roles. No. And here we are in the apartment, um, which is unfortunately very pink. The, the worst part, the great location, and thank you again to Matt for getting us the location. Worst part about the location is every day we had to walk up three very steep flights of stairs, uh, no elevator, with all of our stuff, and it was cold. No mm -hmm. heat. Very cold, very cold. Yeah. So we were exhausted by the time the shoot started every day. Yeah. The first one there had to basically go down into the sub-basement, uh, fumble around in the freezing cold, and find the fuse boxes to get the power up to the whole building. Then we had to haul uh, all of the lighting and camera equipment up every day because uh, the neighborhood that we shot this in is... Not so cool. Not so great. It's being gentrified now. There's actually some really nice stuff there, uh, but uh, not a place where you want to leave anything above 
the posters and props. It was a neighborhood in transition at the time. When we showed up on the set. What is that? Uh, when we showed up on the set, we had to clean the set, and a lot of it was just dust and, you know, debris and all that. Uh, some crack vials, some, um, some condoms. Uh, some condoms and crack vials. And kind of, yeah. Uh, luckily, no needles jutting out that we found. But, yeah, this was definitely a questionable location uh, as far as the history of the building. We wanted to do our best to make it look like a, uh, you know, traditional college slash slacker kind of apartment. So, mm -hmm. fortunately, we are able to work with the nice people over at uh, Globe Posters to get all those authentic. That's Gus Russo's uh, book, yes, The Outfit, right there. that's true. That is our friend Gus Russo's book. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, I do want to make special mention, um, Martin uh, Short. Uh, played Steve. the corpse in all mm -hmm. these scenes. Um, great, great, bag, because he didn't have any dialogue. He worked for us for just peanuts. Yeah. But he's kind of a limber yeah. performer. Mm -hmm. um, so he actually, you know, he was able to bounce well. We need to get rid of this thing. Um, I didn't. I didn't actually know that. Every time I came, he was already wrapped Steve? up in the bag. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize. Yeah. I didn't get well, to he didn't. Meet yeah. Martin Short. He's, he's a method actor. He doesn't want to be seen yeah. by. Yeah. yeah. I, I it's just like Jiminy Glick. Glick. Once you get him into the makeup, I mean, he doesn't break. Every time you think I've given up, um, read a book. It makes a lot more sense now. Yeah. Uh, we've got the monkey in the background. That's an important clue. Uh, we should have pointed that out in the first shot, but we were talking about something else. Well, you shouldn't point it out until the end of the movie. Well, um, no. Hopefully people who are watching the movie now with the commentary have seen the film and we're not spoiling. At least once. Yeah. If not several times. For there example... She is. Gabby Demchuk. Uh, uh, spoiler, she's dead. <laughs> Um, Pat, you're wearing your Danger Seeker shirt, um, Rex Kramer Danger Seeker, it's, it's our little uh, Kentucky Fried movie mm -hmm. reference and was also the name of uh, the first company that we kind of worked on on this film. I mean, this is kind yeah. of a, a Danger Seekers co-production because uh, some of the scenes we'll be seeing in a bit were actually shot under that banner in 2003. Round about, yeah. Uh, it was a website that I had launched with my friends uh, Jim Keller and Alex Gret from college. Uh, we had always joked about launching a review site or writing a book or anything like that, and I just went ahead and bought a domain for the hell of it. Uh, we started writing movie reviews and then sports columns and all sorts of other random happenstance. And... Yeah, we just, uh, we had gotten enough articles up, we had like six, seven hundred articles, and I had written this script, it was going to be a follow-up to another movie that we didn't quite finish, um, and we had started shooting it under the Danger Seekers banner, it stalled for a little while, uh, originally we had a completely different cast, and finally, uh, recast Definitely with me and, and one of the leads, which I had never actually order. imagined and which I was a little terrified of. But you're great in it, so it's... Yeah. Eh. It works. It works. He did, he did fight it, though. Yeah. yeah. I was Absolutely. not nuts about the idea of actually being in the film. Um, but, eh, screw it. I knew some of the lines. thing is, the writer, really not good at being off book. Uh, traditionally. Honestly, no one was really all that good about being off book, so... Mm -hmm. The, yeah. the number of times your brother said, uh, what scene are we doing again? It's not even counted. Yeah. There's our uh, lovely panda poster poster on the wall there. Um, yeah. Not so, sure what the panda's doing, but his crotch is red. So. Yeah, crotch is red. I actually yeah. still have that poster hanging in my apartment. Very nice, very mm -hmm. nice. And here we go. We've got uh, Tim and Joe. We're at St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Church uh, in downtown Baltimore in this scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, which has also gone under a major renovation since. This is one of those original scenes we were discussing. Absolutely, and uh, what was great about it is that they're both perfect for the role. And uh, because they're not in any other scenes, they don't really cross with any other characters, we were able to just wholesale use this footage in the new, new version. Yeah, uh, we had shot these. These were... About, uh, we shot these scenes and we shot a couple other scenes with the lead actors from the other film, which I don't know if we have any of those. We do. Um, um, they, they, they could end up on the, on the uh, DVD at some point, but uh, we'd also have to track them down to uh, get, yeah, their, uh, get clearances, clearances um, for that. But uh, we shot about, I'd say about 20 minutes 
mm -hmm. of the original version. Uh, a couple of the apartment scenes and this scene. And uh, I think we did some of the driving scenes as well. Like one of the driving scenes. And um, just didn't work out. Um, I guess you first showed me the script back in 2000 when we were working on Dead Filler Lives before we did the other movie with the Danger Seekers. And uh, I loved the script at the time. I, I really pushed for us to do it. And uh, we gave it a shot in 2003. And uh, it just didn't happen for us then, so... Yeah, we... A lot of the problem with the original version... Um, we had just done a movie that we had shot. Uh, we had handed over... Uh, we had a couple different people take their uh, crack at editing it. But unfortunately, there were a lot of lighting issues and all that, so a lot of different editors were trying to do as much correction as they could on it. It was a problematic shoot. It was definitely a learning experience, but when we went to shoot Corpus the first time, um, some of the people, I'd hate to say it, did not necessarily take it as seriously as we would have hoped. Yeah. Right, all right. And, and everybody was kind of burned out because we had just finished this long project and there was really no satisfaction from it because we weren't seeing any footage. So yeah. we didn't have a finished version to show them before we were jumping into the next thing. And uh, the final straw, I'd hate to say, it was this one shoot, which was one of the... It's a shoot that actually winds up turning out absolutely hilarious in this version, but um, it's later in the film, there's the corpse cleanup scene, and early in the morning, we got together, uh, we sprayed a room down with blood, and we started doing, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, gags as them, they were cleaning up the room. And uh, Ashley Schaefer, a uh, very, very sweet girl, um, lent us the apartment in Lock Raven Village, uh, where she was staying. We used the room, sprayed it down with blood, and after we got all the shots we needed, most of the cast said, okay, well, uh, I guess we're wrapped, and took off uh, to have some fun. Yes. Um... So, wasn't many of us left, basically, to scrub down the rest of the place, finish repainting the room, and get it back into order so that, you know, she could live there, being her apartment. Uh, so, most of the rest of the day was spent cleaning the place. Um, now, Lock Raven Village is not... At the time, at least, I haven't been there in a long time. Not necessarily yeah, the best apartment complex. It as wasn't far the first as... apartment to have blood on the walls. We'll put it that way. Right, um, but typically their uh, their new uh, tenant practice is to repaint the walls and move you in. That doesn't involve cleaning the walls. Uh, so once we started getting any of the paint wet, it started coming off in thick sheets and falling off in large chunks and leaving a giant pockmarked, uh, mismatched wall that went back anywhere easily six layers of paint. Um, so we had to clean the entire place, repaint it, scrape down the walls, repaint it again, and more or less um, spend, it was about two, three days worth of repaint. It was, it was a lot of repainting. And and this is back before, you know, we, we realized that you didn't have to use Cairo syrup and food coloring. So this stuff was sticky. It was everywhere. Mm -hmm. you know, we had to get it off the floors. We had to get it off the walls. It was just an absolute mess. Yeah. And, again, the paint that they used, I don't know what was going on, but... Seriously, like, you would wipe down the wall with a sponge, you would give it about 20 minutes, and sheets would start falling off. The good news is she did gain some square footage in her apartment. This is true. Nice. That is true. Uh, yeah, we caused her a bit of a panic attack, to which I still feel bad, but we went in and basically made sure to make everything right. But uh, there was a lot of money going into paint for repainting that apartment, and there was not a lot of help from a lot of the people we were counting on. And hence the bad blood, no pun intended. And yeah, not, not even bad blood, done. just basically a shutdown production. Yeah, right. friends with a lot of the folks. Yeah, but just, uh, just, uh, just didn't work out for us that, that time around. But, uh, I mean, thankfully when we were in 2005, you know, we were uh, looking for a uh, new project to do. And we were, you know, kind of in between things. So we had an opportunity to shoot this. And yeah. we did. For very, very little money, but we, we put every penny on screen. And to have a location like this that no one was living in, 
so we could leave it a mess, deal with it later, did make it a lot easier. Now here's uh, Zep Drinkwater playing Byron. Uh, one little eagle-eyed uh, thing is uh, the porno that he is holding in his hand. We took a dollar store version of the Dick Van Dyke show and uh, took out the uh, dick. So it's just the Dyke show. And that stopped the commentary. In the background, we'll see also the puppies. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, get some torment during the movie. That's hanging on my basement wall. Still covered in blood. Mm -hmm. And and the monkey on the table there uh, resides at Tim's house, who played yes. the accountant in the previous yeah, scene. Ted, the so accountant. It's all it's all accounted for. If you ever have an accountant in your film and you don't name him Ted, you're a fool. Um, yeah, we got most of these prints for the walls at Goodwill. Uh, just went in there. Um, yeah, I'm just started flipping through, saying, "Okay, what's some random stuff that we could throw on the walls?" And yes, yeah, very funny. Um, one of the prints that we saw when we were looking through the prints was this really cool uh, Edward Gorey framed picture. And uh, it was eight bucks, so, you know, I bought it. Um, we were a little bit unsure whether we could use it or not because of uh, copyright. Um, but when we took it out of the frame, we realized it was a signed print. And uh, it is worth more than we spent on this movie. So, mm -hmm. yay, Goodwill. Yep, so see, the film's already in profit. That's right. Uh, in this scene, we've got John Egger. Uh, this is, again, one of the original, original scenes. I've known John since I was in high school. We worked at, uh, at a movie theater together. Uh, came in just to do this bit originally, and it was actually a scene when we were fighting back and forth on trying to figure out what to cut, what to keep, uh, what worked for the plot overall. This was one of the scenes that I pushed really hard to make sure that we kept in just because I wasn't honestly originally sure that we could get uh, John and Tim back together again just because of, you know, jobs and all that kind of stuff. And I thought the chemistry works. I thought it was just funny. This just cracked me up, and it was kind of selfish, but I really wanted to make sure to push to have this in there. And as it turns out, it works out because we tied this scene with uh, the monkey and came up with an ending. Um... But this is not absolutely, and I think there was only made one version of the movie. It was very, very early in the cutting that we tried it without this scene. Yeah. Um, and pretty much Pat and I said, <clears throat> "No, it doesn't work without it." Yeah. Right, and, and it's a great scene. Uh, basically, what we just had to do was just go back. To Ron's up in the tree, by the way. That is true. Hey, Ron. Hey. Who you'll see completely conscious later in the party, by the way. Right. He wakes up. Right. He wakes up. Um, what we had to do with, with uh, the other scene was just go back to the original audio of other takes to save it. Right. Yeah, you know, it was just the, the actual master take didn't have it there, but uh, we made it work. Yep. Uh, now here, uh, there's a mention of the Rascally Rabbit. Uh, the Rascally Rabbit is something that Stoney did not know what it was. Uh, for three months, apparently, after the production, yeah. he wasn't sure what it was. He, and he I actually asked on set this day, and um, Gabby, our, our dead girl, is underage, and he asked in front of her what it was, and I could not tell him. I was too embarrassed to tell him in front of her what that it was. it's a large vibrator. Right, so we just kind of had to, we let it roll. I, I think he delivered the line just fine, not having a clue. But Yeah, but yeah, we were describing a large vibrator, which... Three months later, he enough. said, oh, okay, that makes sense. This yeah. is our Benny Hill moment. Mm -hmm. Again, our shout-out for uh, Raven Beer there on the wall. Mm -hmm. Raven Beer, it is delicious, by the way. Everybody in yeah. the U.S. and Canada drinks Raven Beer in this universe. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also a little tricky to get the light down on that one. Um, yeah, originally there was a major spot just kind of just catching that banner, blowing out like crazy, but God bless the people at Final Cut and Color because it's amazing what you can do to drop peaks. Oh, uh, look, the, Pat, there's us. Yep. Oh. Pat wrote this scene, uh, apparently originally with me in mind, because he knew that I'd like to kick the crap out of someone. Uh, I was very happy when Pat ended up taking one of the lead roles in the film, and I found out it would actually be him that I'd be able to beat up. I, I was actually rewritten once I was taken over, because originally it was just the two of us, our, our cameo together was people beating the hell out of each other at a party. Well, I appreciate you. it. Yeah. Uh, I learned how to pull my punches three days after this was shot, actually. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. There's our first glimpse at Mike Stork. And oh, and my brother-in-law Ray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca. She's a very nice. nice necklace. Oh, the necklace, not the breast. 
shot before she discovered too. pinball, really. This is one of those great uh, casting moments where yeah, whatever. looking for the girl who could talk and talk and talk and not say anything, and Pat kind of said, yeah, we know that girl. Mm -hmm. And we told Rebecca exactly in those words, this is what the part is, and she said, oh yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. and she, <laughs> half, half of what ends up in screen is actually things that she came up with on the top of her head rather than written. This is not a stump neck. Which it actually breaks that thing. Yeah, we had to replace that. She um, that was not sawed or anything like that. She just broke a pull triangle that was my around own my throat. Root strength. Yeah, but we went on with the take because we're professionals. And I we're indie, and it's a gun. Yeah. I walked outside and I took the lighter and I was having such a hard time. And, and the this is the outside of Tim's and house. And then I um, right we had to fight with a uh, water heater for supremacy of audio. It's like this time. We won. Right, in the end. We did win. Taco, we did win. It, it was a, and a battle worth fighting. It, and I can't and uh, here is uh, one of your high school stories, right? This is something that you used to talk about at Taco yep. Bell, the Taco Mites. The Taco Mites. Bridget, you want to take this one? Well, you know, I used to I used to always order the hard tacos back in the day, and I got delivered a soft taco, and I was very upset. I had ordered the hard taco, so we, we took a straw and poked a bunch of holes in through the soft taco, and I took it back up to the counter and told them that not only had I ordered a hard taco, but that... The reason I don't order soft tacos is because they have these damn taco mites. And I opened up the uh, wrapper and showed them the giant holes, and yeah, they were confused, upset. Uh, we got kicked out that day. I, we got kicked yeah. out several yeah. Well, days, the taco mites had burrowed right through your taco. Right through the taco. And the thing is, they should have understand. They should have understood that it was a hard taco slash soft taco discrepancy because a hard taco. If you were to slap somebody alongside the face with it, it would have cut them. Right. Whereas a soft taco would have just slapped you around a bit. Exactly. Yes. We wrote songs about the hard tacos and the soft tacos and the taco mites. Now, obviously, this is high school. Um, we got kicked out once for perpetrating British accents without a license. I think that was right. more or less the uh, uh, reason they used. Uh, multiple assassination attempts with coffee stirs. I told you I knew who killed Kennedy. But. <laughs> I don't even know who I am this from. It happens. Yeah. What is this? Who even smokes these? Weren't we surprised when Gus actually told us who did kill them? And they're so hard to light. Yes. Can you believe it? And, and it was... Know. Yeah, I know. Which I never would have called. This is what you gotta do. Oh, this like, scene. I, I don't even know what I can say about this, this scene. This was actually our, what we used to promote the movie while we were still cutting it. Mm -hmm. um, just because it was an easy scene to put together and uh, just fun for what it was. Uh, here's Ev Drinkwater not standing in the back of a bar. Yeah. Uh, Bev Register Banker. Uh, I don't think knew what she was in for when she was coming down to film this, nor did Tara there. Uh, yeah, both of them pretty much. Whoa. Shouldn't have been surprised that my brother did this, but um, those that, reactions are completely real. As is the fire. He had to sign a uh, stuntman's contract to do that scene. We which paid him he, a dollar. Which he did at some point through the course of the night. Before Not, it was shot. Before it was shot. Before it was Kevin shot. Kevin would want me to tell you that. Yes, that was before we shot. Uh, interesting fact here, the guy there in the shot next to Gabby, actually Gabby's father. Mm -hmm. yep. That's Steve. Also, the proprietor of Raven Beer. And uh, if you look in the background here, we get a few of our featured uh, little extras, uh, people that we wanted to have hang out in the background. There's Tim, of course, not playing an accountant or playing an accountant celebrating that. Yeah, there's, there's it's, Kim. Uh, Kim, uh, it's the mentioned. celebrated spirit of, of uh, Small Timor. This is me meeting my brother's character for the first time in the film. Clearly, we have met. The funniest part is, I'm playing the completely fucked up one, but my brother's playing the semi fucked up one, messing with me. In real life, I was completely sober when we shot this, and my brother was bombed. Yeah, your brother started drinking right after he said his hand like that. I, I believe so, yes. Just that one. Me too. And we're getting ready to leave Tim's house. This is the wonderful exterior of his former house. Former house. I still love that t shirt. Too, the Kappa. spooky house. If oh, you yeah, will. that is a wonderful spooky, spooky house. house. Spooky house. 
If you haven't seen the film Spooky House, it's available at video stores near us. It was Sir Ben Kingsley in his finest role since Blood Rain. Mm-hmm. Here we have a couple of cameos. Oh, yeah. okay. Not those guys. They're in the <laughs> yeah, we're cameoing as ourselves in the middle of the... It's my uh, friend yes. Rob Rodman wearing his uh, Dead Filler Lives t-shirt. And there's mm-hmm. a now brother-in-law, uh, Raymond Tarantula, mm-hmm. as the guy who carves a bowl out of fruit. This was early on in our knowing Ray, wasn't it? When we were, yeah, we were still kind of uh, feeling him out. We didn't quite I, know. He was, he was not quite on his way to being an in-law yet, but he was definitely on the uh, I think observe this and the, report. This was the day he proved himself. I like to think of it as. Right. You seen a? He had to make up for that whole Harry Carey moment, but that's another story. Uh, this scene is kind of fun because we shot this very late in the production. So we had already done our version of the blood room in this apartment and repainted it. So that's why if you notice at the top of the frame, is in some of the shots, you see the original paint job. And if you look really close, you might be able to see some pink behind the white on the wall. Oh, absolutely. We did a pretty and not just on the panda. <laughs> uh, love the panda. That is a panda shot. Oh, yes. By the way, we're replacing buffalo shot with panda shot in the uh, nomenclature. Oh, that I mean, why? Dude, why would somebody I, take that photo of that panda? Why would somebody keep it on their wall for so many years? But I love it. I love it. Dude, we're just hanging out, chilling, smoking some weed. It says something about you, Pat. So does most of the script. First time for everything. I still own that coat, and as a matter of fact, I'm back to wearing it now since uh, the coat I bought to replace it was in a minivan that was stolen with a third of my comic collection. Anecdote! Cry. This is fun. He actually did drink some of that bong water. Now, I will will say that for the shoot, our... uh, Bong water wasn't really the same kind of bong water you would normally have. It was catnip, and I think at one point we used tobacco. We did use yeah. tobacco. We yeah. used tobacco. It was um, catnip at, at it, Tim's location. Most other locations, people, we gave them the choice, and they seemed to prefer the tobacco. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the catnip did not go over well, very well at all. Um, I think that's actually how we got some of the vomit takes. But as much as... It would seem like, oh, you're independent, you're low budget, and I'm sure nobody's going to object. Yeah, we didn't want to use actual, uh, so because you know, I, I just don't believe. I mean, I've had yeah. drugs in, in many of the the films that I've made, and we we never use real drugs on set. You know, I don't care what they're doing before the shot or after the shot. You but, lose the you lose the lines, right? Exactly. And we had enough trouble keeping lines, getting lines, yeah. even. And uh, this is uh, my old apartment in Cockeysville. Uh, what's kind of fun there is a nice little exploitation poster, Delinquent Schoolgirls. Um, just this random flick I recommend picking up if you get a chance. Yeah. That's a fun one. It's got Steven Stucker from uh, the Airplane series. That's true, that's true. And Hollywood's first African American stuntman, Bob, Bob Miner. Miner. Everybody's favorite, Bob Miner. Richard who? Big Dick Stevens. What, um, what movie was he in? The uh... He was in uh, the recent remake of Death at a Funeral. Right. He played the corpse he played the Death corpse. at a Funeral. Speaking of corpses, there's some wonderful uh, Photoshop by Pat there to make our dead bodies look deader. Uh, coming up in a moment, where we'll see my lovely wife get murdered with a trash bag. Death by bookcase, as I like to call it. Life that's imitating true, art. That's true. And, it was supposed uh, to be a much a more elaborate death. It was supposed to be much more elaborate, but we could not afford it. Well, it wasn't thing. actually supposed to be the same fight girl character. Mm-hmm. Um, we were on set that day, and they said, oh, and this girl comes in and she dies. And we looked around, and they said, I guess that's you, because there's, there's no other girl here. We don't have an extra on set today. Right, and, and it works, and you play an excellent dead body. I can lay still on the ground with the best of them. No comments, please. You went to Catholic school. I... Uh, yeah, originally wanted a harpoon gun with a um, machete and a catapult, a um, whole bunch of, you know, Looney Tunes type stuff, but, um, we yeah, did. Looney Tunes is animated, and they actually have a lot more freedom yeah. in animation. I'd say so. Uh, Little little note here, when I fall backward in a second, the thump you hear on my head hits the wall, not ADR. That actually hurt quite a bit. 
Yeah. Suck it up. It's coming here. And, and, and since the volume's not on the commentary, we're not going to wait for it. That's not yeah, nice. uh, that's just... But if you heard that thump when you were watching... Thump. Oh! Yeah, it was oh. bad. Yeah, no, was... Um, yeah, that gentle kick, I hurt her. Apparently, I'm a jerk. Now, it was payback I for me not learning how to pull my punches until three days after the shoot. Oh, yeah. Ah, oh, color correction. That is not makeup, by the way. That is color correction making them look all corpsey like Brad uh, stepped out for a moment while we talked about that before. <laughs> you see. <laughs> yes. The magic of commentary. <laughs> Woo! All right. Um, we're about to uh, finish up our first stint in this apartment, and uh, actually, we come up to the magic point to where we use three different locations for the same apartment. Fuck it, it's in Boulder. Well, we've already used two. It is. There's one. There's two. This is a completely different apartment, also owned by Matt. And uh, actually, my good friend Tom Dunn lives across the street in the background there. I think that is his apartment, or right next to his apartment. Um, and in a moment, we will see the in interior of the third apartment. Now, for some reason, uh, Michael Bay insisted on coming on set and shooting this one scene for us. That's why it's a little bit blown out compared to everything else in the movie. This, this is, is the third apartment. This is apartment number three, and they're about to walk into uh, our co-producer Kevin Perkins' bedroom at the time. Movie magic. Yes, movie magic continues in the fact that they are not actually dragging anything. They are miming dragging a corpse into the Yes. I color corrected this uh, mimed corpse. Did we cover that? <laughs> not yet. All right. I'm acting. Acting? This is why writers write. And uh, this is kind of neat. This is uh, a driving scene, but uh, but for uh, just by accident, the, they just, just passed by the uh, hardware the store from Chainsaw Sally. Adventure. And uh, here we go with more driving. We shot this actually with the old Panasonic that we shot Van Movie on. Yeah, uh, Van Movie, a lot of the driver. Um, it's a Panasonic that is just. Oh, uh, this is. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is somebody from a uh, comedy troupe I'm in, uh, Christina Clark, uh, who's now in London, I believe. But um, yeah, we basically wanted to get some reporter footage, uh, just filling in a lot of plot details that moved the exposition along in a very quick and concise way. Um, we'd had a couple people that we'd considered for doing this. Lloyd! Lloyd! Uncle Lloyd decided to do a cameo for us because we asked him to. Right. We were at a horror convention and we literally, uh, we had the camera with us. We're like, would you mind stepping to the side for five minutes? Here's the script. Mm -hmm. Looked at the script for two minutes. Yeah. We, uh, we made up some cue cards for him. Uh, we had a couple different versions of the cue cards. One was the exact script. One was bullet point outlines. And one was just kind of talk about this. And he gave us a couple takes. Um, this is the one we went with because yeah, he knocked it out of the park. He really just covered everything we needed plot-wise, and boom. Uncle Lloyd is a great, great man. If you ever want him to be in one of your movies, uh, just contact him. He's willing to basically do stuff for free to cheap. Uh, he supports independent cinema heavily. He's the, the greatest supporter of independent cinema of the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we thank him very much. For Yay, gracing us with his presence. Yay! Yeah. And uh, to jump back to Christina real quick, uh, yeah, she's in a comedy troupe. Uh, she was in a comedy troupe that I'm a part of, and yeah, we just basically asked her to come out, spend a day, uh, fill in a role that we had been working to fill for quite some time. Um, had a lot of people up for it, but. No, nobody worked out. Yeah, Nobody worked out, but she did a great job. Mm -hmm. She, uh, I mean, everybody knocks out of the park in this movie. I mean, there's nobody that uh, I would really consider to be a uh, weak point in the in the flick that's still on screen at all. Right. There's nothing playing. And uh, here we are. Uh, I think this is uh, Boy Out Route 40. Um, we're about to pick up the Hitchhiker. Mm -hmm. Who uh, has been in and out of this movie um, when we first did, cut the movie. Um, we had that long 20 minute intro that we talked about before and there just wasn't room for the hitchhiker. But uh, when we cut that and went back to the two minute uh, intro, we were able to fit her back in, which is great because it really you know, works for the movie as an extra character, as an extra layer to the movie. Extra character, extra death, extra just mishap along the way. 
Thanks a and million. yeah, losing the long, painful intro really opened up a lot of plot points. Absolutely, absolutely. And here is Sarah, uh, our hitchhiker. North. She does a where. really good job, just like uh, everybody well, else that we will mm-hmm. say over and over and over again. It's quite uh, a no, she was in a it's different not. comedy troupe I was in uh, years and years back. Um, she was in for about a year and a half, two years. I uh, never thought she got used well in that comedy troupe, but I could tell she had some Listen, really good comic timing. I just wanted to make sure to get a spot for her. I actually wrote no, this part for her um, and was just really glad that she could be a part of it. And was really upset when she was cut, and then was really glad when she was back in again. So it yeah. all worked yeah. out. Yeah. Well, sadly, I believe she's given up acting. But, um, we think of that still, I think she's funny, so... Don't pay yeah, glad to have her as a part of it. That counts for some. Yeah. And uh, I mean, basically what happened, uh, the Hitchhiker scenes, uh, we kept in Hitcher the, the best stuff. We shot probably about twice as much as this. But yeah. we had a scene that just, between be between face. audio and, and visual, just didn't work. Um, we didn't really have a lot of time you know, to ADR like goblins, on this, on this flick. Well, we had a lot of time to ADR on this flick. Yeah, but it we was, didn't have a lot of opportunity. Not a lot of opportunity to track people down and get them back into the studio to do it. So... We made a concession, took a, took away some extra scenes. I, uh, you know, basically thought it was kind of funny that uh, Stoney, who's sort of the, the playboy, didn't get any play at all, um, even though he originally did in the script with the hitchhiker. And uh, Pat gets all the girls in the movie. And here we are. We just saw a brief glimpse of Erica Ann. She just uh, walked by. Um, She'll be back. She will Give be back second. very mm-hmm. soon. Her She's, room is locked. Uh, yeah. Uh, this was originally a role written for a friend of mine from high school, uh, somebody who actually wound up being an arch nemesis for quite some time. Um, but we wound up bumping into each other, getting back on good terms. Um, but yeah, I had written the role for uh, JDJ. Um, she'll know who she was. Anyway, um, was written with her in mind and pretty much is. Uh, air, air, air quote note perfect for her. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, they are good old boys, so it's it's good. It, that did fit, originally. Uh, Erica pulled it off, though. Again. Yeah, sure. I mean, she's the closest thing to a professional we really have in the movie. Yeah, she's been in a yeah. few movies. So other she, than Lloyd, obviously. Uh, other than Lloyd, other than Lloyd. And... You know, a couple of the actors have been been one or two things, um, but Erica was in uh, Max Magician and the Legend of the Rings, which you can find in many a Walmart. It is a delightful romp. Nice romp. She plays a elven woman, yeah, and she you know, is just oh, she's she's perfect for the role. Um, here we are, back in Western Maryland, um, driving to Canada. Don't date her. And yeah, with shots from oh, North Carolina, she's from relative. one of the worst <laughs> vacations I ever took, the only good thing that ever came from that vacation, outside of killing a car and coming back with about 100,000 mosquito bites and massive burns, was that I actually got some good second unit footage for our road trip. And believe me, it will be showing up in the movies from now until the time that we stop making Yeah, and I still have the scars. I don't even know if I'm related to this girl. Whatever. And uh, like right now they're having an argument her. over uh, dating newer episode. cousins. So that we can go get some beer. Uh, which was That's inspired. Really, really, really <laughs> which was right inspired now. by certain yeah. friends that some dated people, certain cousins. I didn't get to drink all day. But we're so about okay. to enter Fake so Canada, which is uh, the lovely uh, Charles Village Pub so for real this time, one not one the charred rib. But first, Zeb and Mike are going to decide what they're going to do with the ransom and uh, the cutting off of the corpse's finger. Uh, Mike really sells this. Um, I don't know if uh, anybody has seen Billy Madison, but uh, Chris Farley plays a bus driver in that, and he is the only one who matches the pale to beet red in face that Mike Stork pulls off here in a moment. Um... And, and to know that Mike is actually not exerting any pressure on anything at all. You notice it's all going to be out of frame here in a second. Um, that was acting. The, the that was, blood red face was That was, was acting. acting. And uh, <laughs> here's our fake arm. Um, that was a dollar store arm. And I think we had it on some kind of uh, hinge. So it squeals when he lifts it. But those are real pliers that we got. Mm-hmm. And indeed, 
real blood red redness for my brother's face. Yeah. You can actually just sit there and ask him to make his face go this red. He can do it. It takes some concentration, but he can just pretty much oh. blood out his face. It's one of his uh, many talents. One yeah, of his many lighting talents. himself on fire. Yeah. And uh, if, you, if you really want to be a uh, stickler there, the book just magically changed from the smallest, tiniest little book to that huge tome. I, I sense a missing joke in there somewhere. Something that might have had yeah. to be cut. There's a little Kafka joke that uh, yeah. got cut there, but that, that'll that be on the deleted scenes. Yeah. It was a bad pun involving Kafka. Because, you know what? Kafka really is all about the puns. Oh, the puns. puns. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny stuff. It's, uh, yeah. He used to write I mean, for Henny, Henry, Henny Youngman. So. Mm -hmm. well, and, and here we are in Canada. They're big take fans my of Towson. Please. There's big fans of Towson football and uh, Rolling Rock in lovely, Canada. Lovely uh, April yeah, Monique Burrell um, coming in for us for an afternoon. Um, I kind of wanted her to play something that was completely different than Chainsaw Sally. You know, like kind of take the glamour out of it and just play a nice, uh, normal Canadian girl. Not a waitress, but you know, just somebody who was there who was very helpful. And uh, over at the bar, we have uh, Dave Cinnamon, uh, who plays our bartender. And uh, next to him is uh, Tiffany James. Tiffany James is somebody who I also met. Again, a lot of people through the comedy troupe. Uh, Tiffany wasn't in the comedy troupe, but worked on a couple projects that I had worked with uh, other people in the comedy troupe with. There's a lot of drop. Uh, Roger, who's waitress Yeah, I'm not going to try to die. And yeah, uh, they is, love yeah. the Towson Tigers in Canada. Yeah, yeah very big fans. We're about, we're about to see Matt Herman, aren't we? Uh, just for a moment. Well, there you go. Yeah, Location is, scout, Matt Herman. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's the fuck line Delaware. in the movie that everybody wanted to say, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Fuck Delaware were, was a coveted line. Yeah, but uh, Tiffany was somebody... Oh, actually, real quick. This is the scene. Uh, this scene is the scene that was the... Inspiration for the entire movie. One day, I was just sitting somewhere, and I thought, what if somebody tried to mail a ransom note with a return address? And it just started spiraling away from that, and I started to play out the scene of how would that be discovered, who would get in trouble for that, and this scene is where the entire movie Corpus Christi came from. Um, just because I thought... Well, that's stupid. They, they, they all start with a what if. Mm -hmm. that's, right, that's right. And yeah, it started with a stupid premise, and the characters grew out of it, and the characters got dumber and dumber. I realized the two main characters couldn't be that stupid uh, to be worth following, and they actually did wind up being fairly stupid. But I had to at least give them a chance to be smarter than that. Um, yeah. Uh, so anyway. Yeah. That. This is uh, Brad Jorgensen, uh, again a friend of mine from way, way back. His mom was actually my kindergarten teacher, and next to him is Jeremy O'Barrill, director of Chainsaw Sally and the Good Sisters. And uh, he's great in this film. He uh, acted before he was a director, and uh, he pulls off this role great. He gives a great stink eye to uh, the boys when they are up to their shenanigans. Not sure that was acting. But, uh, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Yeah. But uh, he. he uh, Method acted well. Also, have to say, along the wardrobe tip, wardrobe tip. That's um, another great shirt on Patrick. There, that's my probably my all fine time favorite shirt in the entire movie. Pro life, pro choice, pro wrestling. Yep, with a check next to pro wrestling, it's a shirt I designed way back during the Danger Seeker days. And I tried to wear as many of my own personal shirts. We tried to design as many non-copyrighted, fringy type things as we could. So. uh yeah. So we wouldn't get sued. St any, any shirt that Stoney well, wears that he has a logo well, on, he designed himself the uh, Fuck a Job t-shirt. And uh, the other ones, the Larry Hardcore, Larry Hardcore. Um, which is actually a nod to a oh TV God. series uh, that Your I shouldn't name because then we might get in Fringy. Yeah. Bom, bom, bom. Yeah, well, we, tr we tried, speaking of a Fringy, we tried to keep uh, any uh, logos that we have in the scene. Obviously, it's in a bar. It's hard to keep everything out. But try to cut off any of the logos so you don't see many full logos, with the exception of the two that are right dab right in, in the center of the fucking face. screen right yeah. now. Yeah. Now, let's get back to uh, Tiffany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tiffany James. Uh, she was somebody who I was working on uh, some internet shorts with uh, some friends, and she had been... I buy you a beer. 
involved, I believe, with the comedy <laughs> troupe uh, before I had joined it, or so at least knew them. Um, but get all the balls we shot a couple shoot. shorts right, with her involved, Ooh, and them, what I mean, as I was shooting, movies. I mean, I was just running camera. I wasn't writing or anything no, like that, like but I saw how she was jumping into character. I saw, yeah. you know, just the presence yeah. she had, and I thought she would be perfect for this. So I wanted to make sure to get her involved in this movie. Um, gave her a couple choices as to the different roles. Uh, this is the one she gravitated towards. Um, it was just a fun, you know, lighthearted Canadian role. Um, and actually, the role of Caitlin, just to jump back, was originally written um, as kind of an inside joke with a uh, friend, Lauren, uh, from years and years and years back. Like... While we were putting a movie together, I'd mentioned there was going to be a scene where yeah, you know uh, one of the guys the uh, met a girl in Canada and, you know, just basically almost hit it off but didn't. That was as far as the role went. Uh, Lauren and I started brainstorming because uh, she seemed like a good fit for the role, but then we both started figuring out how to push it further and further. And most of the places that this scene goes way over the edge, uh, when we go back to her place and all that, was originally Lauren's idea. Um, she just kept saying, what if we do this? What if we do this? What if we do this? And me bouncing back and forth with her. And we just kept taking the entire idea wronger and wronger. Probably would never have taken it that place in my on my own, but... Yeah. Works, yeah, and unfortunately, uh, over the years, lost contact with her, uh, bumped into her, actually, after we had had production on this. Um, but, yeah, so, just wanted to make sure to give her a no, shout out to, for... To Tiffany's credit, that we, we uh, changed some things on the shoot on the fly that night, and mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. she was absolutely wonderful, um, open to improvisation, and uh, she really made that scene work. Yeah. Um, makes all of her scenes work, and, you know, she really deserves kudos for, you know, going the extra mile. This was a, a tough day of shooting, because we did all the stuff at the CBP bar, and then did all the stuff <coughs> at the, quote, house in Canada, all in the same day, and that's... This was, oh, yeah. we, all of locations. Canada was one day. Yeah, yeah, all tough. of Canada. Canada, this entire yeah 20 minute sequence we shot about 40 pages this day yeah in about um, i think 12 hours you guys and maybe, that's not, uh, and maybe that's 16 not closer, closer to 16, 16 yeah closer to 16 hours for Obviously, that. 12 hours not counting settles right yeah because we got here at like nine or ten in the morning um and shot through to ten at night drove out to an, our second location for canada Everything at Caitlin's house was done through the course of the night with extra, you know, set up conversations, dialogue, again, reconfiguring the scenes. Right. Um, right. Even and, and that's really why we did a lot of that, was that we'd already shot 12 hours that day. So we, we simplified it and we, yeah. we had to and just fly there, I mean, loose. there was, uh, it's, it's the kind of scene I didn't originally write it for me to be in it. And right. there's a comfort issue. I didn't want to be the guy saying, hey, I'm writing the scene for me to and right. yeah so we toned down some of the gags and we toned up some of the I gags I was going to so say we basically we tried to make we basically went in and said here's the point of the scene let's make it as funny as we can absolutely yeah, which yeah, was the way to go yeah that's definitely the way to go and here, we didn't want to end up with a love scene straight out of the room or anything like that no yeah. god no would have been a bit much yeah this is our first take it's Ron and Tony here yeah. Well, nobody knows uh, with Christina again, and Ron is uh, the head of the comedy troupe that I'm currently in with Christina. Um, should she come back from London and want to rejoin oh us? God. Tony was in a previous comedy troupe we were in. Comedy troupe, comedy troupe, comedy troupe, comedy troupe, comedy troupe, other other film nice. comedy troupe. If you say that five times, doesn't the comedy troupe like come to life in the living room? I hope. Oh, Awkward. So that's why I avoid rope swings now. Uh, true story. Pat did lose uh, hearing in one of his ears by jumping off a rope swing. That's oh, yeah. This is totally true. Happened at uh, Beaver Dam Beaver Swim Dam? Club. Yeah. Um, we need to talk. Can we? So, yeah. yeah. If you ever come up to me at a convention and say, Hey, Pat, I love your movie, and I ignore you, you're talking into my dead ear. If he couldn't remember what, what happened, happened, he had to tell me. Days upon days we were I went off a rope but swing and for landed ear first oh, after a 40 foot drop. Uh, blew out the ear. Uh, didn't uh, realize it at the time because both ears sounded pretty murky because, well, I was in a lot of pain from the drop. Um, later that night, I 
I went to sleep and I went with this, uh, the worst ear on the pillow first. Um, woke up in the middle of the night and the pillow was soaking wet. I looked at it and then there was about a basketball round squad of water that had drained from my ear, but about where you get to like baseball size, it started getting pink and then by the middle kind of got Golf clotty, yeah, it got kind of clotty, and that was all what had drained down on my head. Flipped over the pillow and went back to sleep. About an hour later, I guess, woke back up, flipped the pillow over, looked at it, and yeah, there was my eardrum on the pillow. So, um, so that's a lesson to you children watching this movie. Uh, first of all, you shouldn't probably be watching this movie, and secondly, don't go ear first off a forty foot cliff into water. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. fun to grow on. It's uh, no, a well, yeah, they do grow back. Uh, just so you know, kids, eardrums sometimes they grow back. No four thousand. Sometimes. Plays. Sometimes. Shorter quarters. Def is better. That's not the man I know. Don don don. I'm not gonna let this. Ooh, do, do, do. No. Okay. And uh, uh, here we're wrapping uh, up at uh, the there. wonderful Charles Village Pub. Again, they, they were so cool about letting us come in there and uh, shoot very, for 12 hours straight. I mean, they just closed up the top portion of the bar and let us have at it. They didn't yeah. really bug us at all during the day. Yeah. And uh, Bobby, the bartender, um, yeah, he had set the whole thing up. Um, I don't know that they actually knew when we came in. Uh, I don't know if the guy... Bobby, Bobby kind of told us, exactly. yeah, sure, come in on Sunday morning, everything will be fine. And we showed up on Sunday morning and said, Bobby sent us? And they kind of said, yeah, for what? And we said, well, we're supposed to have the upstairs for a shoot today. And they said, oh, Bobby said it's okay. Somebody in the middle basically, yeah, Sunday might have night. not necessarily oh, gotten all the information. Yeah, so it was side. cool to be shot there, and we're still good friends with everyone there, but... Yeah, it oh, seemed like they just basically yeah. gave us a second floor and said, okay, let's not bother them. Yeah. And we got food. I, really uh, I mean, we, we bought a lot of food. Yeah. Oh, we bought a lot of food. We did yeah. all our craft services with them that day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for us, that's saying something because we really didn't have yeah. craft services beyond cheese yeah. sandwiches for those days. I mean, I've got yeah, it was nice to be able to go downstairs and oh, yeah, right. have a beer in between yeah. takes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or four or five. Mm -hmm. Hey, we'll I see. wasn't on camera this day, so it didn't matter. Right, one more right. Yeah. Yoink. You know what? Oh, hey! I still own the yeah. over shirt, by the way, which I've had since again high school. It is wow in piss poor condition, but um, it's kind of like one of my signature outfits. It's, it's one of those shirts. It's, yeah, it's kind of a lucky shirt, um, if you'll notice. On both sleeves, um, yeah, the buttons have long since been gone. Uh, not just because the buttons are gone, but because the little button holes are ripped through. It's what my dad would have called a, a Saturday shirt. Yeah. Something that my mom wouldn't let him wear outside unless it was Saturday and he was doing yard work. Yeah. No, stupid. I mean, I'm not trying to bore the listening audience you know, with, you know, oh, look at my oh shirt, my blah, 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 we're me, Justin and Kelly, and oh, look holy. at my wig. Look at that no, hat. All, all these nice. hats are wonderful. Oh, yeah, this was my favorite day because we had oh, new hats. Buddy. Just trying to say that we you made this with. movie for not a lot of money. Uh, really? Not a lot of money hey. at all, to the point where Hush. not American much new wardrobe so about got involved in this film. There was very little wardrobe in this movie. I think I think Mike's the only one that got any shirts. Well, Mike had the, we bought the dress for Mike, which is, we already saw that now, scene. If there's a way maybe Did we buy that dress? I thought somebody yeah. had it. It wasn't my dress. It wasn't my no, dress. No, it wasn't my, oh, wait a minute, yes, it was my dress. Yeah. I thought we goodwilled that dress or something. You know, I'm pretty like sure road, Mike just so had, somehow, Mike pulled that dress out, out for that scene. I don't think anyone bought it. I think Mike took care of getting that dress. Well, your mom's reaction when she came out and that scene was being shot was priceless. She kind of did a double take and then said, if anybody wants food, it's ready, and then walked back in the house. Mm -hmm. She's used to those kind of shenanigans from her sons. And, and Canada. Yep, Canada. And uh, we're at Max's house. Max was our uh, graphic artist. So, on the film. left the keys in the ignition. Yeah, no, uh, Stoney there is reading an Urbanite magazine well, uh, that features an uncle, uh, an article about my uncle, who's the pastor of the church minutes. we filmed in earlier. That is true, that is true. And he's, I believe he's on that article right now. Um, 
But uh, Max was great. Uh, the car that you'll see destroyed in, in uh, a few minutes uh, stayed uh, there for about a year. I apologize for the copyright violations of my tattoos, but they are real. Also, I apologize for my belly. Really, I was going to say, you're, you're apologizing for the, tattoo, the tattoos, because I'm about to see your ass crack for the one millionth time. The only way I can ever see my ass crack is on film, so this is kind of a novelty, because my head doesn't crane around that far. There we go. Um, I believe it was uh, Allie's house that we filmed this at. Or farmhouse. I think so, yeah. Yeah. She was very nice, giving us use mm -hmm. at her, of her house till two in the morning that day. Yeah, I was not there that night, but I heard she was sweet. Stony does a wonderful little double take here at the refrigerator. Ooh. Nothing. This Nothing. means something. Zool. Hey. Um, and this is this is all improv the day of, of shooting. This is yeah. Fun, yeah, fun little stuff. The idea was basically her and I in bed, not so good. Uh, some of this stuff seemed a little weird, so we basically just kept coming up with gigs that we thought were funny. And it's just kind of... This was one that was one of the original gags. The popcorn gag was just always something funny. If you didn't find it funny, I'm sorry. We don't agree. We disagree with you. Yes. There I looked punch you in the taint. But no. we will rescind that punch to the taint because clearly you have bought the DVD. Concentrate. I'll still punch you. No. Well then eat. You gotta find him first. That's right. But thank you for buying the DVD and I apologize for the taint punching disagreement we may have. And uh, it's kind of fun here what we did with uh, Stoney's Little Watch there. We used the wonderful archive.org to come up with some uh, old public domain movies about Canada and the Mexico border. Come on, cowboy. Come on, yeah. Fit yeah. perfectly for us, you know. We went the, the kind of riff tracks kind of way with just uh, finding really cool public domain stuff. If you ever need any kind of public domain stuff, just not just old films and educational films, tourism board, all that kind of stuff, but they actually have an amazing stockpile of uh, just scenes, uh, you know, background shots, second unit, third unit type stuff. If you're filming a Western and you need, like, Western mountains and all that, by all means, go to archive.org. They've got a ton of footage that people are putting up there for you to use as independent filmmakers. Yeah, Fantastic right. site. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I you know, obviously you can use them for sound effects as well. Mm -hmm. Sound effects, music tracks, all that kind of stuff. It is wonderful. I like it a lot. And this is the end of the night. I think you could tell on everybody's face that this is 2 in the morning. We are... Fucking done. The poor Stoney's been sitting on that sofa for three hours. Oh, right boy. Point. Yeah. That's tough. No, I'm like, oh, so I have three shots at this location. Okay, let's shoot me out last. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can let yourself. Yeah, shoot. Uh, bye. Oh, you're such a rube. He didn't quite get the message here, and uh, he's about to get the message. Yeah. Very slowly, but there he goes. And they're yeah. off, back to America to oh, do the right thing. Oh boy, oh man, I wish they wouldn't have talked so much with that air in that part of the commentary. And uh, yep, here we are back in the apartment, and they are hacking into something. Yeah. This day was a fun And this is, the, these are the shirts, these are the shirts that we bought. These for, are the, the big purchases. Oh, right. We had to put a budget heads. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's all on screen right there. That was it. Okay. Every penny. Uh, well, uh, yeah, there's a little more money than was spent on that, uh, but all of it was used on the big blood day. We had some buckets and some sponges and some uh, pads and That's some true. things like that. Yeah. I'd say basically the budget was more or less the blood day. Um, well, blood effects in general. Blood effects in general, the tapes that we use to shoot on. And, and food. And food. Yeah. Well, and, and the art that we have hanging up, but honestly, we all would have bought the pandas and the puppies so, anyway. Hence why they're all hanging at our house. Right. right. Yeah, it, again, uh, just a quick note to anyone who's an independent filmmaker out there. Um, if you're ever going to make something, 
you don't know it now, but the biggest budget you will have you is food. You, didn't leave the right. you have to feed everyone. Until you're a studio film and you have a craft services budget okay. separate, if you're making something on your own and, oh, I've got friends who will do it for free, and, oh, I've got locations for free, food, food, food. And, you know, it's it's really easy. All you have to do is go to your, you know, local Dollar Tree and buy a few loaves of bread and a few, you know, cheap peanut food, butter, peanut butter jelly, jelly, cheap cheese. Yeah, $10. $10 Sodas and all that. And it's enough to pe that people can snack on through the course of the day, but it still adds up and it will still be... For a micro-budget film, it'll be your biggest expense. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, I mean, not every day you can, you'll have an opportunity to go to the dollar store. Sometimes you'll have to order pizza, sometimes you have to order wings, subs, whatever. Sometimes everyone put in a long day and you want to take them out for dinner. Absolutely. And absolutely. you say, first round's on me. That adds up. Here we are. Oh, that's our one exterior of the apartment. Uh, in reality... When you're on the other side, uh, that door leads to just our control room where we had all of our walkie-talkies and monitors. And I'm sure if you look very carefully into the reflection on the TV, you see me and my cameraman. Here we are in the Blood Room Part Two. The uh, Guar Beach House. And this is uh, this is much better, honestly, than than the original Blood Room. Um, the, the first one was just like, it was so quick. Yeah, I mean, it was a one day shoot. It was, and again, one day air quote, in that I got there at 9 a.m., I think. Um, everyone followed suit over the next two hours, and the cast left by four. For this one, we had an entire afternoon to shoot it, and it was this this scene and the uh, montage scene were two of the things that were a little bit more fun for us to shoot because there, there were really no rules to how we shot. Yeah. Very fun days. Yeah, on this on this go around, everyone got the fact that this was supposed to be fun. Yeah. This was supposed to be a, an old school '80s like John Q. Sack, Savage Steve Holland montage. We were far enough along in filming too. Everybody was used to being with each other all the time. Everybody knew each other's sense of humor. And it kind of, people kind of came out with a, hey, how about we do this? You know, yeah, it was a lot of playing. It was a lot. Everybody throw your gags at the wall. I mean, there's literally. gotta be. Literally. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another good reason we didn't have to worry about what we did to the place. Well, and it was nice to not have to clean it up before we went home that night, that's for sure. Although well, that was not really the, the happiest with us yeah, that we painted so over Bible, the blood and uh, <laughs> we redid it. So you guys we got a know, lot of that yeah. blood. Down. Oh, we did. It was horrible, too, because it was frozen up there. It was frozen, but the thing is, the blood we used, um, all you had to do was wet a sponge and wipe it down, give it about two minutes, and then re-wipe it, and it came right off. It dissolved well. If you were patient, if you were scrubbing, it was a pain in the ass. It dissolved well if you were patient and if you could wipe it the second time before it froze. It was uh, freezing outside and probably even colder inside the apartment at this point. So it was. Here's here's the outside. Here's the roof. This is um, you know not only we we thought it was cool that we had this roof as a set, but uh, we kind of wanted to pay just a little bit of, of an homage to the room by having a scene unnecessarily on a roof in the middle of the movie. Well, the difference is, is that we do not green screen one bit and we show the beautiful city of Baltimore. We, wanted to show some Baltimore. we actually went out on a roof. We found a roof we could use and we didn't have any kind of sudden Johnny subplots. We were talking earlier... <laughs> no footballs. We were talking earlier about the um, neighborhood that we were filming in. I remember during this scene, Mike is delivering this big pivotal speech and there were some bums on the street in the alley behind him and they heard him delivering the speech from the roof and they shouted up, Hey, can you toss us a quarter? And he actually stopped and turned around and told him to fuck off. He was making a movie. And I had to wait for the bums to move on before we could get the next tape. <laughs> The rest of it, though, started with you. What are you going to do? You're going to walk through life forever? Right now, they're just trying to figure out what they're going to do with all these bodies. Your character's kind of given up on the whole deal. Mike had the base. This was basically meant to be the big meatballs, Bill Murray, it just doesn't matter speech. Um, it's the, you can do it, like, 80, again, a lot of this movie was basically the 80s template. 
and there's an agreeso yeah, mod. Yeah, we okay. push this just, I'm you know. Gonna stay here. I'm gonna fix this. But, uh, I think we can do it fine. Walk away. He sort of kind of, like, he did about so half for Canada his Ho. own material, half what was in there, but, you know, got the whole idea to together. Get the spirit of it. And then, of course, Zeb's arms behind his back the whole time because. What good is an 80s build-up without an 80s music montage? I'm staying. What's the plan? It's and it's going to come up very, very soon. Right now, in fact. And I'm telling you, this montage, I'm a big fan. Uh, Cracks me up every fun. time. This was, uh, this was the one day that, uh, during the whole shoot, that it was, it was really it was just the core cast and uh, really myself and, and Bridget on set so we were just throwing everything everything literally throwing everything this gag oh pat man how you hold cool. on to that cigarette i'm not sure but it's a miracle it's brilliant it this, is a miracle it's oscar um, worthy i basically all i had in my head was i wet my lip the way uh dan Aykroyd did in ghostbusters to get the venkman Vegman. hence why my mouth is open it's still dangling um it's, yeah Right. The fact that it held that long, though. It's like the Hanukkah of... Uh, and um, you should rewatch this movie several times. Make sure you see everything that's going on in each of these panels. It's it's some good stuff. It is some good stuff. But it was uh, good for us to, to condense it into... Uh, Absolutely. Little... Nobody wanted a 45-minute montage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, except for Paul Thomas Anderson. But he had no say in this. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's the tangy bong. Mmm, something sounds wrong. And we're off for the races. Still blood on my panda, still blood on your puppies. Those didn't really get cleaned through the whole course of this. Mm -mm, mm -mm. There's still blood on those puppies, and I've washed that down several times. I cannot, it, it just continues to bleed. I honestly like the puppies better. And than there's our last shot of Martin Short. Bye, Martin. Sorry about tossing you off the building. Nice. What do you think? Huh? This was uh, filmed before smoking in apartments was banned in Maryland. And that's another one of Stoney's uh, shirts I can't quite see. I think that's a Larry Hardcore. Yeah. All right. I didn't believe you guys when you said we could This is an 18 tribute, right? Yeah, yeah, a little 18 tribute. Yeah, you know, just that. You got to do the 80s montage, you got to do it all the way. And uh, there's our CGI window. Was blown yes. out to hell, so we just uh, a little bit, a little bit, covered it up, covered it up a little bit. Yeah. This is our deeply ADR scene because mm -hmm. apparently streetlights in Baltimore buzz like the coming of the B apocalypse. Yeah, it was like we were reshooting Amityville 3D, so uh, we uh, we dubbed that over. Mm -hmm. You've been drinking a lot lately. It's but, pretty damn so, awful. But uh, it took us a while, but uh, different days, but we finally got Ron and Tony mm -hmm. in two rooms. Not a room, different rooms. I think one of them was shot in my basement, and the other one was shot in your apartment. Yep. And where did that furniture come from? And actually, there was another ADR scene where the whole scene was played off of an iPhone <laughs> into into a, yeah, into just a stage mic into a DAT, I think. I well, which one was that? Uh, some of Stoney's ADR. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, we, we went through and just did a whole bunch of ADR for him. Um, I don't think it was my trivia. No, it couldn't have been. Uh, There's the other car that died in the uh, making of this film. That's the car true. was actually almost dead when we started filming, and we said, we have this car, it's on its last leg. We, we should smash it up, blow it up in a film. So we there were three. And, and it actually yeah. sat in that garage um, that we mentioned earlier, Maxis, for a year. And uh, still start right up. Uh, it didn't sound very pretty, but it started right up. And you'll notice the wisdom of these guys burying the dead bodies with snow shovels and sand shovels. And yeah, Martin Short was not available this day. So uh, we had to settle for a uh, lesser known actor that's uh, Tim Mazurki from uh, Silent Live and the Police Academy sequels. No, just two, three, and four. We thought, you know, we, we've hit up Lance Kinsey. We, we'd leave him out of this one. Yeah. This was a, a fun day of shooting, too, though. How deep do you think we should dig? I enjoyed this outdoor. Well, this is, honestly, out of everything that we shot, this is probably my favorite thing. You know, it's it's pretty much exactly 
you know, script to film exactly how it played out. So um, everything works. Everybody's performance is great. You're not um, this was shot actually on the, uh, this is second unit. This was shot on the Panasonic. Um, Panasonic did just fine in the outdoors. So it works fine yeah. for this, this scene. We need to have some See? color issues just based and on sift, uh, shifting light, shifting sunlight, and uh, just, yeah, yeah some of the settings on the camera. Right. <laughs> I, I did like that we were filming outside. Um, part of this is on the side of the road. Like we have side bloody people on the side of the road huddled around a car. And people just yeah. drove by, slowed down, just and looked. Actually, no, nobody stopped, nobody back. offered help. Nobody sped up. But a couple yeah. weeks after we shot that, I was at a horror convention, and I was talking to some other indie filmmakers, and they had the same thing. They got arrested for doing it. So, well, lucky we didn't get arrested. Luck of the draw. This is my dad. Um, it was my birthday present that year that I get to kill him on screen. So I did it with uh, the card that he hated. So uh, Hello. take that. Anybody here? But, yeah, particularly him. You know, he's laying on the side of the road with a Did you just hear something? Oh, yeah. branch yeah. through his body. Impaled with and a branch. And people are just everywhere. like, honk, honk, how you doing? Yeah, people are waving. Like, hey. Movie magic. You hold up the camera. Oh, wow, look at you. You're John Waters. Stoopy doo And uh, here you have the Willem scream. Okay, I know I heard something. It's a classic. Like yeah, I heard it too. Dude, we gotta go find out what the fuck that was. Return for deposit. Yet another stony shirt classic. Uh, what's kind of fun here um, to uh, keep continuity? Um, obviously, as a human, uh, my dad did move a little bit while we were uh, shooting this. So I actually uh, took the still from this scene, and uh, that is a still frame around him, bordered around him. If you look very, very closely, the branch above his head a couple times falls invisibly out of frame. They're going to report this to the police. Yeah, I believe that you went to that because I thought it looked good enough and your little brother yeah. saw the movie and your little brother goes, Dad's okay, but I can totally see him breathing. And we're like, oh, back to the drawing board. As you see, it works just fine. So, there you have it. And, uh, of course, Stoney is going to vomit some more because uh, he can do that on cue. Really? That's what Stoney does. He's good at it. He's a champ. He's a pro. And uh, that's our exciting special effect of Kevin Perkins at the back of the car shaking said car to make it look like we're trying to start it. a little bit. You're on his leg. Obviously grinding on the man's legs and tearing him apart. Blood does not quite work that way, but shh. On our budget, that's how biology is. And that's the last we saw of that car. And in the background, there's dun, the dun, third dun. car that has died from the production of this film. Oh, and a fog machine. We killed the fog machine. We did. Oh, <laughs> we God, right over yeah. the fog machine. Uh, not that it was used in the film, just that we backed over it. Well, it just couldn't be used in the film because we backed over it. So. Yeah. Yeah, so one of our finer function. moments. And here we are at the finale. Uh, now you'll notice they've had to repaint the apartment. So we no longer have our globe posters. Um, it took great fun making up these posters uh, that you're going to see on the walls yeah. here now. I'm not sure why we thought that the characters would necessarily just decide to make their own advertisement posters, but they did. Um, so yeah, there's fun Easter eggs within. And now they're sitting in a tube in my basement. And in this shot, you can really see the spots on the walls we missed, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, lots of pink here. <laughs> it, it's continuity now. Oh, I understand. But they did, in fact, do a half ass job. It's a wonder Matt never talks to any of us. Yeah. He's talking to you guys? Who? Uh -huh. Well, I, we weren't invited to his wedding, but we're still, you know, friendly ish. Yeah. Friendly, friendly. If yes. I were on Facebook, we would be friends. Sure, sure. All Here's right. Chris so, and Mike. To address the facts, um, love them both, but. The police costumes, first off, there were several different discussions about where were we were getting the police costumes from. Um, ultimately, I don't think any of the conversations were resolved, and so last minute, 
This is the police costumes we got from a local rental shop. Local rental shop, obviously. Um, Chris fits his just fine, and you'll know which one Mike is when I say Mike's doesn't fit so well. Um, um, extra large. And yeah. I think both costumes were ordered in the same size. They are not the same size people. Also, um, other issues with. I believe they might be like hot stripper, cop. yeah, hot cop, hot yeah, cop hot uniforms. Cop. Because I, I've never seen a cop with a see-through hat. Well, now I have. But well, yes. Yeah. Before this, are we going to divulge the big bit of movie magic in this scene? The fact that Erica has never met half the people in this scene. That's true. I just divulged it. She's we, not actually in the room. We, we shot her on a completely different day. Yeah, her stuff not even remotely the same day. Well, she still hasn't met a couple of the people in this scene. Um, yeah, I mean, she's not. She hasn't seen the movie, so she hasn't been to any of the premieres. I think she's met most everybody at this point. What? Um, probably, probably not the uh, gangsters. No, oh, no, she's met. She's them. definitely met them. Yeah, through uh, uh, through Lance, through the troop. Yeah. All right, it's one of those. Rocky Horror. Right, we all live in Baltimore. We've all met each other. Yeah, it's right. Baltimore. We also all look the same. And here, uh, coming up is how we cover up the movie magic by having Stony walk into her shot with the same outfit that he is wearing right now. Be right back. That will happen momentarily. And, uh, of course, the panda did survive. Me too. Two shakes. There we go. Oh, well, my God. It's like it's the same day. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the Officer Speed Holy joke shit. is a double hit. Uh, one, a reference to one of my all-time favorite movies, Super Fuzz. But more importantly, a Baltimore reference. Officer Speed, if you're in Baltimore and you've never been pulled over for speeding, you don't know him. We all know him. But if you've we ever all know driven him. in the Delaney Valley Road corridor, particularly in the back roads, uh, 10 miles an hour above the speed limit. You've met Officer you've, Speed. You've met him. Right. Yep, Officer Speed is a legend in Baltimore. And in case you haven't met him yet, but might in the future, he does not think his name is funny. Also, he has retired, but he's still around. So... He, he's probably the old guy who sits on his front porch with a speed gun, clocking people for fun. Yeah. You just shot another man. He's a super, super, really super trooper. All right, hold it. Under 30 seconds, so we don't have to. Thank you. Now we're going into our fabulous dream sequence, which would have been a little bit more fabulous if we had remembered to bring tape the day that we were going to a carnival. Yes. The entire cast. Uh, now this song uh, was written by Zeb and I. Uh, in the, there was originally a time where we found out we had a premiere. Um, the film hadn't been finished yet, so it was a one-week turnaround to basically get as much of the film done as we could. One, one week turnaround with two of the principals on their honeymoon. Right. So I tried to get as much as I could done, a whole bunch of color correction bits, um, some of which we kept, some of which we didn't, some of the edits obviously kept and not. But one of the important bits was getting the soundtrack together for this film, which is fairly intact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and this song was... Yeah. Brilliant. This song was written uh, basically within that week of all the stuff going on, uh, Zeb and I got together and we're recording a bunch of music. Uh, Zeb and Wes and I at one point uh, were recording chunks of score, um, some of which again we used, some of which we didn't, but Zeb and I basically sat down and said we need a friendship song, something that's goofy, silly. Right, we originally um, had uh, Sigmund the Sea Monsters playing there. And right, it was wanted, kind of like a template. We wanted something similar to that, but you know, yeah. with its own vibe. So I sat down on his couch and started writing out lyrics. I'm like, here's the rhythm, ba 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 ba. And he started writing the music. I started jotting down the lyrics. He said, I'm done. I said, I'm done. And so he started playing the music he had. I started singing the lyrics. We're like, awesome, okay, close enough, let's tweak it. And then we just sat down. He laid down the music tracks. Then he played. We played the music tracks, and him and I just busted out the vocals, and we got the first draft version. We wound up doing more versions for later yeah. version, you know. But it's pretty close to yeah. what the, the first version. It's was. it's the exact same song, just you know, we recorded cleaned up tracks and with more vocals. And it has some great friendship lines. Friendship right. is black tar heroin is one of my favorite oh, rhymes yeah. I've ever heard. Yeah, the whole song was come up with in maybe like twenty minutes, and, and that was works. between cigarettes and. Get out of 
Just it's five very, minutes of action. It's very funny. Yeah. It's a good. It's a great uh, last kick in the movie. Come on, man! Get a gun pointed at you. And now we are wrapping up the movie Corpus yeah. Christi. We have our and bookend. Right. To go. Right. Yeah. But their credits to be had first. No. Da, da, da. I, went, I went with the. Uh, hey, that's you. The Animal House kind of meatballs. Everybody laughs. An improv take credits. And he became a senator. <laughs> so uh, I hope everybody enjoyed themselves. We're about to get up to our little bookend scene here. But uh, if you. Any other stories you guys would like to tell? We have a few, couple more minutes left in the in the reel. Um, well, there was this one time um, back in the day. You see, I. Oh, not that's appropriate, Pat. Ooh, that's true. No, that's I don't think true. you should tell that story. I know where you're going. The alarm clock. Yeah, no, no, please. Don't. Okay, I won't tell the alarm clock story. For those of you out there who know the alarm clock story. Insert laugh here. <laughs> but it is pretty nasty. Okay, um, alright, let's see which other ones we've got. Uh, we could tell... I don't know, the, the, the best part was in the apartment building, this old rickety ass apartment building that we were shooting in, and uh, just creepy as hell downstairs underneath it was all stone and uh we that, found that baby doll? we found a baby doll nailed oh. in a ziploc bag to a wall nailed to the wall it was really creepy i'm glad we found that um after we've been shooting there a couple days because if yeah. i had found that before that we started shooting so we might have had to freaky. find another location i completely blanked on that yeah wow, we've got pictures that of that still oh yeah we got okay. pictures of that that was bad yeah. <sighs> and here's our little Let's oh. wrap it all together. And, and yep. This was again written way, way after after we had dropped in a flop threads. Also not in the same yeah. scene together. These Absolutely. guys have we yep. never met this other guy they're talking to. Yeah, this to. was two separate nights. Two separate Fisherman nights. And uh, you know, John here is the only one to be on both really? versions of the movie. Uh, yeah. it, officially. Officially. Because I mean Tim is in the background of that scene. But his yeah. character's the only one that we yeah, yeah, he, used this is the footage. Yeah. There you go. Good it's good stuff. Game, it is good stuff. Thanks to the FOP Lodge for letting us have mm -hmm. the wonderful, wonderful set. Because it does. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's very authentic. It looks like a police. Because it is. Yes. Um, yes. Also, again, thank you to Charles Village Pub. Thank you to uh, the Charred Rib Restaurant. Uh, uh, thank you to Tim Frost, Matt Herman, uh, anybody else who left Allie. us locations. Allie. Mm -hmm. um, locations, all the actors, obviously. Yeah, I mean, and again, everybody was wonderful in this. Um, you know, originally we set out to have 100 investors, and, you know, people invested not only money, but time. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, everybody came together to make this film with uh, paper clips and scotch tape. And, yeah, you know, this was pre, uh, what's the website, the Kickstarter? Oh, pre Kickstarter, uh, yeah. pre any this of that, was, you know. This was, this, this, we started filming this before Facebook was even really big. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, we just, we went out there and basically said we wanted to make a movie. We knew it wasn't going to be expensive. Oh, again, thank you, Felicia Carter. Wow. Oh, and, oh, and the yeah. music. And Lisa, all, Lisa all Cerebro. All the music. Great end credit song. You know, I've been in love with this song, you know, since I heard it back in the 90s, and uh, she was really sweet. Let us use it. Mm -hmm. It's been in, uh, you know, major productions as well as ours. And um, just thanks, everybody. I mean, everybody just really came together and just did a really good job. Mm -hmm. And uh, good the night. new phone books are here. Yay. Yep, new phone books are here. Thanks, everybody. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs>